Hello, and welcome to the Environmental Law Monitor. I'm your host, Daniel Pope. This podcast is brought to you by Bracewell LLP's Environmental and Natural Resources Group. And we're so glad that you're here with us checking out our podcast. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at themonitor at bracewell.com, or you can follow us on Twitter at Bracewell Enviro. You can also connect with us on LinkedIn as well. We've been working towards this, our first episode for a little while now, and we're glad to share this with you. We're hoping to use this podcast to cover notable developments in environmental and natural resources law and policy. And we're also going to cover other perennial topics related to litigation, enforcement, diligence, compliance, you name it. Now, I suppose I should introduce myself seeing as we're going to be spending some quality time together talking about these important developments. Uh, Like I said, my name is Daniel Pope. I'm in Bracewell's Austin office, and I'm an associate who's been practicing for a couple of years now. If I sound older or maybe a little bit more grizzled than you'd expect, it's not just the allergies. Uh, My legal career is actually my second career. Before this, I was a high school history and literature teacher. The partners made me sign a contract saying I wouldn't do a podcast discussing whether the Code of Federal Regulations is harder to read than some of William Faulkner's weirder stuff. But, you know, if that's something you're particularly interested in, I can put you in touch with them and we can work towards something uh, that we'll both enjoy. Now, I could do a lot of throat clearing about this podcast, uh, why we're doing it, what we hope to accomplish, what we hope that you might get out of it. But I think I'm going to save that for later and jump into our first topic. Uh, For now, simply go ahead and subscribe to The Monitor on whatever podcast streaming service or app you're using so you can get notified when we release new episodes. Today, we're going to be discussing President Biden's climate agenda in the context of the Clean Air Act itself. If you're listening to this podcast, you've probably heard some of our other presentations like our webinars or seminars, and we've talked a lot about how the Biden administration has emphasized that every federal agency is obligated to respond in some fashion uh, to climate change. Political appointees and career staff alike have been tasked to review existing programs. Uh, They've been tasked to look at those programs from a climate change perspective precisely. And the administration's also announced that climate change is going to be a feature of its national security decision making, its foreign policies. So it's hard to overstate how significant climate change is for this administration. And obviously, we're still at the stage where we need to forecast a bit on what future policies might actually look like. But that's where our first guest comes in. What we want to do today is to draw the climate change conversation back into the Clean Air Act itself, where it all began, or at least where EPA was told it could begin in Massachusetts versus EPA in 2007. To discuss how the administration might use the Clean Air Act itself in furthering its climate agenda, I'm joined by Jeff Holmstead, a partner in our D.C. office. Now, many of you already know Jeff, uh, but if you don't, he's exactly the kind of person you want to hear from on what EPA might do under the Clean Air Act. Among a variety of his interesting experiences, he was the former assistant administrator for EPA's Office of Air and Radiation. Uh, So Welcome, Jeff, and thank you for joining us on this inaugural episode. Uh, No pressure. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be your first guest. You don't feel uh, the weight of this podcast and all of its hopes and aspirations weighing down on your shoulders too much, I hope. Uh, I certainly feel that weight, but I think I can bear up. (laughs) Okay. Well, you know, so Jeff, it strikes me that at least on greenhouse gases, uh, the Biden administration, at least, you know, from my perspective, seems like they have something of a clean slate. You know, the clean power plan itself was stayed by the Supreme Court. And then before that litigation could be resolved, the Trump administration defunded the plan, pulled the rule, and then attempted to replace uh, the clean power plan with the affordable clean energy rule. And then on January 19, I guess that was just one day before President Biden took his oath of office, The D.C. Circuit vacated the ACE rule and told the EPA to consider uh, those regulations all over again. So at least from my perspective, it seems like there's some open ground here and maybe the way there isn't under other major regulatory programs. So are are we going to see Clean Power Plan Mark II? Is this sort of like a once more with feeling kind of administration on that topic? I think the answer is probably not. Um, And here is the reason why. Um, You are, of course, correct that the D.C. Circuit um, struck down the the affordable clean energy rule, the ACE rule that was issued by the Trump administration. And they also struck down EPA's revocation of the clean power plan. And 
in effect, what the D.C. Circuit said was the Clean Power Plan was fine, that what EPA did the first time is perfectly acceptable under the statute. Um, now, that, that was, of course, two, uh, two judges on the D.C. Circuit. There was a dissent by a third judge. Uh, not surprisingly, the, the two judges who, who upheld the reasoning of the Clean Power Plan were both Obama appointees, and it was the Trump appointee that dissented. So if you believe that those two judges will have the final word on the issue of what EPA can do under the Clean Air Act, then you would say, yes, they have, you know, a complete open field with plenty of running room. But I think EPA, both at a political level and at a career level, understand that those two judges on the D.C. Circuit are unlikely to be the last word on the matter. Uh, you talked a little bit about the history of the Clean Power Plan, but um, it, it, maybe the most important thing to remember is for the first time in history, the Supreme Court actually stepped in and stayed a, a rule until it, the Supreme Court, could pass on on its, on its legal validity. Um, and I, I think it, it was correctly read as an indication that the Supreme Court at that time was skeptical of what the Obama administration had done under the Clean Power Plan. And since then, the Supreme Court has uh, almost certainly become even more skeptical. With Justice Kennedy having retired, mm -hmm. Justice Ginsburg, um, there are pretty clearly six votes on the Supreme Court who are likely to be skeptical of um, any agency's claims of broad new authority um, under their various under their various statutes. And in fact, there were some decisions and even some speeches given by some of the justices. And so I, I think EPA is well aware that if they simply redo the Clean Power Plan and do it more aggressively, it is unlikely to pass muster with the Supreme Court. Yeah, especially with Justice Kavanaugh having kind of an administrative background coming from the D.C. Circuit, too. Well, and and uh, uh, and Justice Gorsuch, who had has been very critical of the Chevron doctrine and giving too much deference to administrative agencies. So, you know, both of them, I think, have been viewed as as justices that would be skeptical of anything like the Clean Power Plan. Okay, so given that there's a, a pretty serious, you know, protracted litigation risk here, uh, and that, you know, basically what you're saying is that maybe one of Trump's most significant regulatory reforms was actually his judicial nominations campaign. You know, one of the things uh, now that we're talking about it that I recall hearing from uh, Janet McCabe was that she thought that the Clean Power Plan, at least it, as it was promulgated under the Obama administration, uh, that it was basically out of date in 2021, right? This was like a 2016, 2017 solution. Four years have passed. The picture looks a little bit different. Certainly the country's leadership profile with respect to this topic looks a little bit different, uh, at least internationally. Uh, so, so given all of those things, what do you think we're likely to see on greenhouse gases directly from EPA? Here's, here's the thing I would point out about that. EPA's authority to regulate the power sector, or, or at least to regulate directly CO2 emissions from the power sector, or really any industrial sector, are, are pretty constrained. Um, I, I think that, that both at a staff level and a, at a political level, they're sort of struggling to decide what, if anything, they do they should do to regulate greenhouse gas emissions directly from the industrial sector. But it's quite interesting that, that the industrial sector and even, even the power sector are not their primary target at this point. Uh, when they came into office, they said that they, that they really had three priorities. Number one was to redo the, the CAFE standards, the gre greenhouse gas emission standards for vehicles. And, um, I'm sure many of your listeners will will remember the history there. The Obama administration had some very aggressive standards. The Trump administration rolled those back e even more than the auto industry wanted. And um, mm -hmm. a, a good share of the auto industry 
entered into a sort of a side deal with the state of California saying that notwithstanding the weaker federal standards, they were going to meet some, some, some other standards that were sort of halfway between California and the Trump administration. So priority number one for them is to redo the standards for the trans the transportation sector and the transportation sector is now the largest emitter of greenhouse gases of any and of any sector of the of the economy and so that that's really their their top priority and we understand that there are negotiations going on right now between uh epa and the auto industry and and california the, but and interestingly, the, the second priority um, seems to be methane emissions from oil and gas operations and, and maybe from other operations as well. But we know that the primary focus is oil and gas. The way you reduce methane emissions is exactly the same as the way you reduce VOC emissions from the oil and gas sector. And EPA has well-established tools. There's there's really no question about their legal authority to set standards for methane emissions from oil and gas operations, exactly what those standards will look like, how far they will go. There's still some open questions there, but we also know that EPA is working um, to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions initially from new oil and gas operations, but then shortly thereafter from existing operations as well. So I, I, I think you know, those two sectors are their priorities for now, um, while they continue to look at what they can do in the industrial sectors. And, and Daniel, you know, one of the things that you and I've talked about a bit is it may be that they, that they try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions indirectly by more heavily regulating conventional pollutants, both air right, pollutants that's, and, that's and water effluent and other things. Yeah. That's under the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, right? Um, the or, kind of not classic criteria of pollutants. Y- y- yeah, but not even not even necessarily the, the, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. I, I think the view, and, and we've seen this from some of the environmental groups, is if you just make fossil fuels um, less attractive economically, that's one of the way you can switch, especially the power sector, to other sources of generation. So... Um, you know, you you may remember, although this was probably before your time, and this is back when you were still a history teacher, or maybe in law school. But uh, the Obama rule that that actually caused the largest number of coal-fired power plants to shut down was not the Clean Power Plan, but it was the the mercury and air toxic standards, and those standards regulated mercury and and other air toxics, but. In doing so, it required coal-fired power plants to install a lot of new control technology, and there were a number of plants for which that was just uneconomic. And so rather than installing new controls, they, they simply shut those plants down. And uh, there's certainly talk among environmental groups that that may be their best and most legally defensive approach for phasing out especially coal-fired power plants. You know, I guess what I would say is certainly in the environmental community, there is some talk that the that at least the best way to phase out coal fired power plants is to regulate them more heavily with regard to conventional pollutants, whether you're talking air pollutants or whether you're talking water effluent or 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 coal ash. And so i I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing, more regulatory activity in that area as an indirect way to reduce CO2 emissions. Well, so let's, let's, um, let's talk about that a little bit more though, because, you know, I, I'm still learning how this framework, uh, actually works in reality, but, but if a new standard was promulgated, whether for PM 2.5 or, or the administration took another look at the ozone NACs, uh, what's the actual time frame on implementing those? Because my understanding is that you, you know, you have the scientific review and the actual promulgation of the standard, but then states have to incorporate those standards into their own plans. So can you walk us through what that would look like? I mean, that seems like that would take the entire first term. Well, I think there's no doubt. Well, I think there's little doubt that they are going to lower the standard for PM 2.5. Uh, and I think that will 
happen sort of independent of any climate issues. And you're right, taking action through changes to the national ambient air quality standards, the implementation timeline takes a while. But they have other ways to regulate existing plants directly for other pollutants, including for hazardous air pollutants, right? I mean, under the under Section 112, they're required to do periodic technology reviews. And the question is, well, will they try to use something like that? Or will they look to tighten further the water effluent guidelines or the, the rules for handling of coal ash? Those are, those are other things that have certainly been raised um, by the environmental community. If, if, you, if we're focusing on the, on the criteria pollutants for, for which there are national ambient air quality standards, you're absolutely right. Um, that, you know, if, if they started tomorrow in an effort to reduce the standard for PM 2.5, and they have to propose, they have to finalize a rule, that's at least 18 months um, to work through that process. Then they have to, within a year after that, they have to do designations. And after the designations are finished, then states have an opportunity to do their state implementation plans. And at the same time, EPA may be able to do a rule to deal with interstate transport of, of air pollution. That that takes a while, and, and you probably wouldn't even get to the last step until the very end of, of, the, of the first four years and, and maybe the only four years of the Biden right. administration. But I, I think, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if they will lower the ozone standard, but I think it's quite clear that they, that they will take action to reduce the PM 2.5 standards. Well, it seems like EPA has a lot of tools that it can use or a lot of moves it can make under the Clean Air Act, um, whether that's going after methane directly um, or taking one of the indirect approaches under NACS, under Section 112 that we've discussed. And so we're obviously going to be paying attention to that. Um, Jeff, we might have to follow up in a few months to see whether any of our predictions here have come to pass or if we need to do a hard reset. I mean, I'm feeling pretty confident uh, that, that we've outlined some pathways, some things that we're likely to see. But then again, I'm new here <laughs> before I let you go. Uh, I do have one final question. And uh, although actually I've, before, can I just mention sure. one other thing that I think is important and I'll try not to go on too long. No, go ahead. The, the administration is under pressure to regulate CO2 emissions directly, especially from, from the power sector. So I, I, I'm not saying that they won't attempt to do something um, because I think there's something of a political imperative to show that they're regulating greenhouse gas emissions directly. Um, but whether they try to do something else like like the clean power plan, I would be surprised. I mean, they, they actually might try to directly do a, a cap and trade program for CO2, but but I think it will be interesting to see what, how, how, if they want a lot of, devote a lot of resources to an effort, n- knowing that there's a good chance it will be struck down in court. And I, and I, that's one of the things that I'm looking for. And I, I think they haven't made that decision yet. Yeah, that makes sense. That's kind of like a tension that they, they may be dealing with. Um, fulfilling a campaign promise overtly, or, you know, it seems like one of the risks with an indirect approach towards dealing with some of these climate issues that we've just been talking about. Um, you know, we might get what's going on and we can have a podcast where we have you on to talk about what's actually going on and uh, how this is an interesting strategy legally from EPA, but I don't know what that looks like to, you know, a normal voter. Uh, who's not a high information uh, voter, at least on these issues, like we, we might be. Um, but, but before I let you go, Jeff, um, I do want to ask you one question. We're going to try to do, I don't know, I think of it as like a cool down session at the end of the podcast, like a lighter item to relax our listeners as we make our way out of these uh, more on topic discussions. So Jeff, I'm, I'm curious to hear, um, especially as we make our way out of the pandemic, you know, what's something that you've picked up during this time. And I mean, aside from the vaccine or maybe some antibodies that you think you're going to stick with after we return to normal, like, should that actually happen? You you know, I, I, I would mention two things. Um, Like many other people uh, we've purchased a Peloton, what indoor bike and 
I Same never here. ever I never ever thought I wanted to to uh, to exercise that way. I do like to bike outside, but I've learned that that's a pretty good way to get a to, to get a good workout. So I will. Um, I'm not going to invite people to follow me on on Peloton, um, <laughs> uh, but but I think I'll do that. You know, the the other thing that f- that for me is. Um, I think even more important, like, like many lawyers, I, I, I work a lot and, and I come home from the office and I have dinner and, and then I often have more work to do, but, but I've become more disciplined about, about actually trying to just stop work at some point. And, um, you know, that's not always as early as I would like, but I really make an effort and it's been nice just for my wife and I to spend time together. I mean, we've, we've watched more television. I think many people have, but it's nice to, to just have some time to sit down and, and talk or sit and, and, and watch something. And so even when I'm going back into the office every day, my, my goal is to make a real effort to stop work at a certain time so I can, I can devote the time to my family. And, and, and that's been a, a very nice thing about the, about the pandemic. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for uh, wising us up on some of the different pathways that EPA has before it. Um, And thank you listeners for spending a little time with us. Obviously, we're going to be paying close attention to what EPA does on these topics and other topics on other developments. Um, There's a lot to pay attention to in the news, and we'll be following up with Jeff and others to dig into these developments as they happen. So from all of us in the Environmental and Natural Resources Group at Bracewell LLP, thanks for listening and we'll see you soon. Okay, so that's Jeff and that's our first podcast. Um, Jeff did actually let me follow him on the Peloton network and it's just scary, his level of output. So if you're a Peloton user, you know what that is. Um, But thank you guys for listening. you know, usually that's where we'll wrap when uh, we finish our conversation with our guests. But I wanted to share a little bit more about why we're doing this podcast and what we hope you get out of it. If you're still listening, uh, there's probably a good chance you've connected with us through our webinars, through our semi-annual seminar or elsewhere. And so it's not a surprise to you that we like to stay on top of uh, environmental and natural resources developments at the federal and state level. Uh, And we especially like to share what we're learning and what we're thinking with you. So uh, at the same time, we recognize that you don't always have time to sit in front of a computer uh, and and watch a webinar and a screen presentation. Um, You may not be able to do the same with our virtual seminars or our in-person seminars. But as things uh, start to open up, we thought it might be helpful for you to be able to access some of our key insights or observations, you know, during your commute or during a walk or during a workout, whatever you're doing when you reach for your phone to listen to a podcast. So we're hoping that the monitor is useful to you wherever you are and whatever familiarity you might have with the topic. Uh, We want to be both accessible and engaging. So for example, if you spend uh, most of your time working on issues related to water or uh, regulatory requirements for projects, uh, we still want conversations like the one I just had with Jeff about EPA and the Clean Air Act to be engaging, to help you understand the broader developments in environmental and natural resources law and policy. But if you are that air specialist, uh, we also hope that you found something useful in our discussion today as well. One of the best ways for us to know how we're doing is for you to connect with us uh, and, and let us know what's working for you with this podcast. So you can email me at the monitor at bracewell.com. Or you can follow us on Twitter at Bracewell Enviro. If you're not following us on LinkedIn, go ahead and do that too. If you like where we're going with this podcast, but you have some suggestions, reach out to us, let us know. And thank you for taking the extra couple of minutes to listen to this. Uh, We deeply value our relationships with our clients on a professional level, but we also value those relationships on a personal level. And we hope this is something that benefits you in a real way. So again, thanks for listening and we'll see you soon.